Now, there's um, earlier at the outset of the conversation, I mentioned that even infertility has an origin, has, has some degree of um, development because of insulin resistance. And it's a perfect example of both of these parts of insulin resistance, where in some instances, insulin isn't working very well. Always with insulin resistance, blood insulin levels are higher. So for example, erectile dysfunction is the most common form of male infertility. In fact, its connection to insulin resistance is so strong that just a few years ago, I, I was so struck by a title of a paper that had just been published, which stated something like, is erectile dysfunction the earliest manifestation of insulin resistance in otherwise young, healthy men? Now, what is the connection? It's because in a normal erectile function, in order for the man to have normal erectile function, he has to experience a pretty dramatic increase in the size of the blood vessels in his body. The blood vessels expand, that increases blood flow, and then he has normal function. Part of that signal that tells the blood vessels that it's time to expand is actually insulin. And so this is what I said earlier, where insulin does so many things in the body, and we only think of it as being relevant to glucose, and that's not fair. Insulin does a lot of stuff, again, including telling blood vessels to expand. Now, unfortunately, in the case of this unfortunate this unfortunate man, his blood vessels become insulin resistant. So now it's insulin coming and knocking on the doors of the blood vessels saying, hey, it's time to expand and increase blood flow. But the blood vessels don't respond. They don't listen. So they stay constricted. Blood flow stays insufficient. And thus he has erectile dysfunction. There are two pathways to insulin resistance. So uh, two, two roads that get to the same destination. Again, the destination being insulin resistance. There's the fast lane, which I call fast insulin resistance, and it actually has three lanes, which I'll describe in a moment. Then there's the slow insulin resistance, which is a more, it, it takes a little longer to get there, but at the same time, it takes a little longer to get away from it. So I'll start with fast insulin resistance because the slow one ends up getting a little excitingly complicated, but in a cool way. So with fast insulin resistance, there are three things that I could take you to a, a clinical lab and I could make you insulin resistant in six hours with either of these three things. But as quickly as it settles in, if I remove those things, your insulin resistance would go away. So these are fast causes and they're fast resolution. They are stress is a, is a primary cause of fast insulin resistance so too is inflammation. And then lastly, and this is going to sound somewhat paradoxical, too much insulin is also a cause. And I'll end with that one because I think it's the most important than transition to slow insulin resistance. So anytime the body is experiencing too much stress, it will very quickly become insulin resistant. Now, as a professor who teaches endocrinology, no surprise, I define stress in the context of hormones. And there are two primary stress hormones, cortisol and what we call in the US epinephrine or in the UK adrenaline. Those are the two stress hormones. Now those hormones are very distinct. They have almost nothing in common, but like when you are feeling a little stressed, it's both of those, especially adrenaline slash epinephrine that are making you feel a little jittery. It's making your heart beat a little faster. You're a little more alert. Um, that all starts to play into a stress response. But what those two hormones have in common is that they both want blood glucose levels to climb. It's kind of their way of saying, hey, we don't really know what's going on right now, but we want to be ready to run away. Or to, that's the fight or flight kind of aspect to stress. And so they want to push blood glucose levels up and they do very well. That of course puts them at odds with the hormone insulin. Because these two, epinephrine or adrenaline and cortisol, the two stress hormones, they're pushing glucose up. Insulin wants to push it down. So the more the body is, has those stress hormones elevated because of, say, sleep deprivation, that's a very effective way to, to increase cortisol. Or they are taking too much, drinking too much caffeine. That is a way to increase epinephrine quite strongly. If both of those signals are too incessant or you know, they continue to be present and climb, then insulin has to work harder and harder. And then we have insulin resistance. So stress is a cause of insulin resistance. But then next is inflammation. 
you, you, know, you, you and I were commenting about earlier about how, boy, there's a cold going around. People, it's flu season. Even then, if a person were wearing a continuous glucose monitor on the back of their arm, measuring their glucose levels, they would see their glucose levels are much, much higher, like significantly higher during the time that they're struggling with this infection. That is a reflection of insulin resistance. Insulin's having a harder time keeping the blood glucose levels in check. <clears throat> Anytime inflammation is up, insulin resistance will be up as well. Even in things like autoimmune diseases, there are reports in humans that document the degree to which someone has, say, active rheumatoid arthritis. Their, their joints are achy because of, of an autoimmune attacking of the joints. They will note on some days, like every autoimmune disease, there is an ebb and a flow. Some days it's good, some days it's bad. And on the bad days, if you measure their insulin resistance, it is absolutely locked with the degree to which their immune system is turned on or off or higher or lower. So inflammation is another cause. And then the last one of the fast lane of insulin resistance is too much insulin itself. Now the astute listener will realize the kind of circular thing I've just presented by invoking high insulin as a cause of insulin resistance because they will also think, but wait a minute, Ben, you just said that high insulin is also a consequence of insulin resistance. That, you know, back to the bouncer knocking on the, the, the door of the muscle cell, if one bouncer wasn't enough or one molecule of insulin wasn't enough, the body will say, okay, well, let's send 10 molecules of insulin. So high insulin is both a consequence of insulin resistance, but it's also a cause. And this is reflective of a fundamental principle in all of biology that if there is too much of a stimulus, a cell, if it's capable, will try to become resistant to that stimulus. This would be like a, a funny analogy of in, 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 my, in the Bickman home, my darling wife is home with the children. That is what she wants to do. She, she is full-time mom. When I'm home and I try to be home as much as I can, it's funny for me to note the difference in how quickly we each respond to our children. I will hear my child saying, mom, 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 and she's not responding. Mom has heard this for so much that she's become kind of selectively deaf to when my children are demanding her attention. I'm not as around my children quite as much because I'm working during the day. And so when I hear that, it's a very fresh signal to me. I've not heard it so much that I've become deaf to it. And so I will respond even though I'm in the other room because I'm so much more sensitive to the clamoring for attention. This is like the body in response to insulin. If there is always insulin, it's always going up, always going up, the body will start to say, the muscle cell will start to say, boy, insulin, you are knocking on my door all the time. This is getting old. I'm not responding anymore. I'm not gonna listen as much as I was before. So in that sense, insulin, too much insulin becomes a cause of insulin resistance. And back to what I'd said earlier, I could take you into the lab start infusing you with just a little drip of insulin to increase your insulin, and over just a few hours, you would become demonstrably less sensitive to it than you were before we started. But again, as I take that away, give your body a few hours and it's back to normal. In every one of those instances, it's a fast onset and it's also a fast solution if we can take it away.